Chapter 2, Jewish Fables by E. Michael Jones Harari's Ignorance How is it that Professor Harari's fictions are true and everyone else's fictions are false? Once again, the only plausible explanation is Professor Harari's ignorance. Harari is unaware that his materialism is self-contradictory. This is something that Harari could have learned at Jesus College because the paradox of materialism was formulated by both J.V.S. Haldane, who studied at Oxford, and C.S. Lewis, who used to teach at Cambridge. As they put it, If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. If, as he seems to believe, history is nothing more than the description of the motion of atoms in the brain, Harari could have written a much shorter book and spared us the effort of slogging through his 400-page tome. Tacitly recognizing this fact, Harari changes philosophical horses in midstream, abandons his materialism without telling us, and claims that human history began with something he calls the cognitive revolution. From this point onward, quote, historical narratives replace biological theories as our primary means of explaining the development of Homo sapiens. To understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interaction of genes, hormones, and organisms. It is necessary to take into account the interaction of ideas, images, and fantasies as well, end quote. If this is the case, then Harari's case for materialism, along with its foundations in Darwinism, collapses because the cognitive revolution must be based on cognition, which is another word for mind or reason, which means that materialism is no longer true. But it turns out Harari doesn't believe in cognition either. Later in his book, Harari remounts the materialist horse he previously abandoned and, in a gloss on the American Declaration of Independence, informs us that, quote, Just as people were never created, neither, according to the science of biology, is there a creator who endows them with anything. There is only a blind evolutionary process, devoid of any purpose, leading to the birth of individuals, endowed by their creator, should be translated simply into born. Equally, there are no such things as rights in biology. There are only organs, abilities, and characteristics, end quote. Certain political consequences flow from Harari's atheism. To begin with, liberty does not exist because there is no such thing in biology. Liberty is something that people invented and that exists only in their imagination. Well, the automobile is also something that people invented. Does that mean that traffic jams exist only in the imagination? Is the social order like liberty? Or is it like the automobile? Or should I say, automobile? Harari tries to evade the contradictory conclusions his premises demand by claiming that we believe in a particular order not because it is objectively true, but because believing in it enables us to cooperate effectively and forge a better society. Turn the page here. Harari's use of the word we remind, reminds one of the joke about Tonto and the Lone Ranger, whose punchline is, what you mean, we, pale face? who, in other words, gets to determine whether believing in a particular imagined order really enables us to cooperate effectively and forge a better society. If there is nothing objectively true about that order, it will get chosen because some people like it. If the people who like it have political power, they will impose this imagined order on the rest of us. If the social order has no basis in nature, its only other possible source is human will, but not just any human will. In the absence of a moral order based on the logical structure of the universe, the only possible alternative social order is the one in which the powerful get to impose their will on the weak, and this is precisely the order which Harari is proposing. And if the people who don't like it lack power, that order will get imposed on them whether they like it or not. So, in the final analysis, Harari's philosophy comes down to might makes right. If justice is just a fiction, then truth, or what is scientific or real, is the opinion of the powerful. As I said, certain political consequences flow from Harari's description of the universe. The first is that there is no such thing as a natural social order. The only things that qualify as natural are derived from physics or biology, as interpreted by intellectual commissars like Professor Harari. Anything else is a human con construct or fiction which gets imposed on nature, which can refer to the physical order or, in this instance, other men. So the social order is an imagined order, which is to say imagined by some people and then imposed on others. This order is always in danger of collapse because it depends upon myths, and myths vanish once people stop believing in them. In order to safeguard an imagined order, continuous and strenuous efforts are imperative. Some of these efforts take the shape of violence and coercion. 
So, oddly enough, the universe, according to Professor Harari, ends up looking a lot like the Israeli occupation of Palestine, which is based on theft and injustice. The Israelis, who impose this order with violence and coercion, needn't feel guilty because in the big scheme of things there is no such thing as justice. Quote, Hammurabi and the American founding fathers alike imagined a reality governed by universal and immutable principles of justice, such as equality or hierarchy. Yet the only place where such universal principles exist is in the fertile imagination of sapiens, and in the myths they invent and tell one another. These principles have no objective validity, end quote. Harari's claim that universal GPS signal lost. Harari's claim that universal principles have no objective validity is objectively and demonstrably false. The fact that no one has ever touched a circle, something which does not exist in nature, as Harari defines that term, does not mean that we cannot make objective and true statements about the radius and circumference of every possible circle. But Harari quite rightly goes on to say that ideas like justice and equality are inextricably intertwined with the idea of creation. Harari can only base his claim that there is no such thing as justice on the previous claim that there is no such thing as God, which is an irrational statement, first of all, because it is impossible to prove a negative, and secondly, because it is possible to prove the existence of God. Because the existence of an orderly universe necessarily implies the existence of a creator as the source of that order, the social order by which man orders his existence is the logical corollary of the order of that universe. Harari willfully ignores all this in claiming that Darwinism has proven there is no God. As the basis for his claim, there can be no such thing as justice. With an airy wave of the hand, our Jewish professor dismisses any possible just social order as well by linking it to Christian myths about God. Quote, the Americans got the idea of equality from Christianity, which argues that every person has a divinely created soul and that all souls are equal before God. However, if we do not believe in the Christian myths about God, creation, and souls, what does it mean that all people are equal? Evolution is based on difference, not on equality. Every person carries a somewhat different genetic code and is exposed from birth to different environmental influences. This leads to the development of different qualities that carry with them different chances of survival. Created equality should therefore be translated into evolved differently. Take a swig. Notice how Harari frames the issue in order to arrive at his justification for an unjust social order. Ignoring the fact that God's existence is a matter of reason, not of faith, Harari turns the tables on those who are rational by claiming that creation is based on Christian myths about God. The existence of God is, thereby, removed from the realm of reason and placed within the realm of faith, which is ipso facto the realm of the irrational. How could anyone expect a Jew to believe in Christian myths? How can anyone expect a Christian to believe in them if they are myths? Harari then proposes something fundamentally irrational, namely atheism as the essence of rationality. The world has been turned upside down in one more instance of what I have characterized elsewhere as the Jewish revolutionary spirit, which began when the Jews crucified the Logos incarnate. That event inaugurated the Jewish war on Logos, which has perdued to our day and which finds expression in Professor Harari's book. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that Harari's book is one long attack on language, speech, and rationality, all of which are subsumed under the Greek word logos. Speech, it turns out, is the main characteristic that distinguishes man from animals. The ancient Greeks understood that man was different from all other animals because he could speak. The word they used for rationality was logos, which is also the word for speech, discourse, language, and other related concepts. Logos is the word or that by which the inward thought is expressed. It is equivalent to the Latin words ratio, vox, and oratio, or that which is said or spoken. It is frequently translated as word, language, or talk, as in a saying, or statement, or maxim, or resolution. It can also be translated as speech, discourse, or conversation, as well as the power to speak. From these more basic ideas flows the idea of rationality itself. Logos means both thought and reason. When Democritus says that something is katalogon, he means that it is agreeable to reason. Logos becomes, therefore, the distinguishing feature of, hu of a human being. En andros logo enai means to be reckoned as a man. Ho logos compromises both the sense of thought and word when it is used in the New Testament. After meditating on the by then thousand-year-old concept of logos, the medieval scholastic successors to the Greek philosophers coined the term rational animal, animale rationale, 
rationale, is the essential definition of man. Unlike angels, man had a body similar to the bodies of other animals. His distinguishing characteristic, however, was the fact that he could speak and reason, terms subsumed under the Greek term logos. Given the Jewish revolutionaries' relationship to logos, it comes as no surprise that Harari's book is protracted is a protracted attack on all of the concepts the Greeks associated with that word. Materialists believe that consciousness is an ignis fatus, which flutters over a swamp of stuff called atoms or matter or whatever. Given that fact, human beings get demoted from being a rational animal to, as Harari puts it, an animal of no significance. In stating his thesis, however, Harari immediately contradicts himself, quote, there was nothing special about humans. Nobody, least of all humans themselves, had any inkling that their descendants would one day walk on the moon, split the atom, fathom the genetic code, and write history books. The most important thing to know about prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no more impact on their environment than gorillas, fireflies, or jellyfish, end quote. If, the perceptive reader might ask, there is nothing special about humans, how did they accomplish all of the things Harari just mentioned? Harari claims that people were outraged when Charles Darwin claimed that Homo sapiens was just another kind of animal. He then proceeds to give the Jewish reductio ad absurdum of Darwin's already absurd idea by claiming that, like it or not, we are members of a noisy family called the great apes, whose nearest relatives are chimpanzees. In fact, just six million years ago, a single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, the other is our own grandmother. Harari, it seems, can't expunge the book of Genesis from his mind, perhaps because its central assertion about the human race, namely that all humans have descended from one man and one woman, has been validated by the Genome Project. Harari's cognitive revolution corresponds in time with the emergence of chromosomal atom and mitochondrial Eve. Quote, In 1987, after some calculations, it was concluded that Y chromosomal atom lived about 60,000 to 90,000 years ago in Africa. The date is rather approximate, since such calculations are not very exact because of some uncertainty about mutation rates. In a similar way, everyone alive today can also be linked back to mitochondrial Eve. She must have lived about 140,000 to 120,000 years ago. But as usual in science, things keep updating. Recently, the difference in years has been estimated for Adam between 120,000 and 156,000 years ago, and for Eve between 99,000 and 148,000 years ago. End quote. It turns out that human language, what Harari calls the cognitive revolution, and the two humans from whom all other humans descended apparently emerged at around the same time. The coincidence puts Professor Harari in a bind. If there is no real difference between humans and chimpanzees, how can Harari say that Homo sapiens conquered the world thanks above all to its unique language? If Homo sapiens has a unique language, how can Harari claim that he is just another kind of animal? Harari never resolves this contradiction. He makes both contradictory claims throughout his book. If Homo sapiens has a unique language, then he is not just another kind of animal. He is completely unique. The same is true of his uniqueness, vis-a-vis, -vis any other hominid, like Neanderthal man, which Harari proposes as the intermediary step between apes and man. Abandoning his materialism in the light of irrefutable evidence surrounding man's ability to speak, Harari identifies this turning point in history as the cognitive revolution. Quote, the appearance of new ways of thinking and communicating between 70,000 and 30,000 years ago constitutes the cognitive revolution. What caused it? We're not sure. The most commonly believed theory argues that accidental genetic mutations changed the inner wiring of the brains of sapiens, enabling them to think in unprecedented ways and to communicate using an altogether new type of language. We might call it the tree of knowledge mutation. Why did it, why did it occur in sapiens' DNA rather than in that of the Neanderthals? It was a matter of pure chance, as far as we can tell, end quote. Harari attempts to have his cake and eat it too when he claims that language makes man unique am among all other, all of the other animals on earth because genetic mutations changed the inner wiring of the brains of sapiens. First of all, how does he know this is true? He is stating as true something for which there is no evidence. He has simply extrapolated the claim from the premises of Darwinism. Leaving aside the cause for a moment, we are still confronted with a problem. If, as Harari claims, all humans had a common ancestor, one which he identifies as a chimpanzee, how did the cognitive revolution take place? 
Did a monkey suddenly start talking? If so, to whom? To another monkey? If what he calls the tree of knowledge mutation took place in just one monkey, that monkey would have no one else to talk to. No communication would be possible because humans can talk, but monkeys can't. The linguist Noam Chomsky, who does not believe that animals are capable of human speech, agrees that the transition to human language was sudden. It looks as if, given the time involved, there was a sudden great leap forward. Like Harari, however, Chomsky feels that the cause was some small genetic modification, which somehow rewired the brain slightly and made this human capacity for language available. Like Harari, Chomsky is intellectually crippled by his adherence to the claims of defunct biologists. Because he limits the cause to genetic mutation, Chomsky is forced to conclude that the advent of human language had to have happened in a single person, without evidently thinking through the consequences of that claim. If human language came about through genetic modification, the same fully formed language would have to appear simultaneously and by chance in the minds of two human beings living in close enough proximity that these two humans could speak to each other something which is so improbable that it is virtually impossible. If the cognitive revolution is another term for the emergence of speech, and if the defining characteristic of man, even according to Harari, is his ability to speak, then man had to emerge full-blown as homo sapiens from the moment he began to speak, at the time of what Harari calls the cognitive revolution. Beyond that, homo sapiens had to emerge as a pair of human beings who could speak to each other simply because of the ex ex exigencies of language. Exigencies. If there is only one man, communication is not only unnecessary, it is impossible because it is not communication. Communication requires two human beings and a language that allows them to communicate effectively immediately. Language can grow in vocabulary and sophistication once it exists, but it cannot evolve from something that it is not. Evolution, in other words, can play no role in the cognitive revolution. It's an all-or-nothing proposition which necessitates creation as its cause because all of the parts, man, rationality, and speech, had to come into existence out of nothing simultaneously in order to function. One term is a function of the other. An ape which can speak is by definition a man. A man can either speak or he cannot speak. He cannot speak by himself. Language involves not only speaking but understanding as well. It involves, of necessity, a speaker and a listener. Because of that, man's language had to come into existence full-blown in two humans at the same moment in time. The moment one man spoke to another man in a human language, he ceased to be anything other than a man. This fact gives new meaning to the first sentence of the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the world... En arche in ho logos. The human race began, in other words, when one man spoke the first word to another man, or as the author of Genesis would say, to another man who happened to be a woman. The fact that we have all grown accustomed to caveman stories, Mickey Mouse cartoons, and the opening scenes of 2001 A Space Odyssey does not change the fact that only humans can speak and that they can only speak to each other, and that in order to do that, they must share a common language from the moment they begin to communicate a moment which is coterminous with their existence as human beings. After finally making some progress in explaining why human beings are unique, Harari returns like a dog to the vomit of materialism and takes it all back by claiming that there is nothing special about language because every animal has some kind of language. Even insects, we are told, know how to communicate in sophisticated ways. It's difficult to infer what Harari means by sophisticated, especially since he immediately contradicts himself when he describes our language as something that can produce an infinite number of sentences, each with a distinct meaning, something which distinguishes it from the language of insects who know how to inform one another of the whereabouts of food, and the language of a green monkey which can yell to its comrades, careful, a lion. Unlike both of these animals, a modern human can tell her friends that this morning near the bend in the river she saw a lion tracking a herd of bison. Harari gets away with contradictions like this by using verbal sleights of hand based on the equivoc equivocation of crucial terms. His use of the term language, for example, is completely equivocal. In fact, his entire argument is reducible to the equivocal use of one term, namely language, to describe two completely different forms of communication. Animals can communicate by barking, chirping, growling, hissing, etc., but only man can connect a limited number of sounds and signs to produce an infinite number of sentences, each with a distinct meaning. Language is, therefore, proof that man is unique, which is precisely what Harari denies when he describes him as an ape. 
Apes, we know from experience, can communicate, but they do not talk. Anyone who has children and a dog as a pet understands this. Dogs bark and wag their tails from almost the moment they are born, but never progress beyond this form of communication, either with their masters or each other. Children begin their lives as communicators on roughly the same level as the family dog by smiling or crying. But by the time they are around a year old, they begin speaking words, and within the next year of their lives, begin speaking in sentences. Children pick up their native language effortlessly from their mothers, which is why the Germans refer to it as their Muttersprache. Children, in other words, have a natural aptitude for something that non-rational animals can't learn at all, in spite of some species' ability to mimic sounds. Everyone knows this, but the Darwinian instant insistence that humans were only different from animals in degree, rather than kind of led to various campaigns to teach animals to talk. The simple fact that a laborious campaign needed to be mounted to bring about what happened effortlessly among children was studiously ignored. Since the great apes resembled humans most closely in physical appearance, they became their preferred candidate, even though parrots had more suitable vocal cords. After years of failure in their attempt to teach non-human primates to imitate human speech, two cognitive researchers, R. Allen Gardner and Beatrix T. Gardner, came up with the brilliant idea of teaching American Sign Language to Washo, 10-month-old chimp they had rescued from military scientists. Ignoring the fact that sign language was speech only by analogy and that it was made up of gestures that were intrinsically ambiguous, the gardeners soon convinced themselves that Was Ho was communicating with them in a way that was reliably understandable. Three years later, the gardeners issued a report on Was Ho's progress, which indicated that the speech barrier separating humans and animals had finally been broken. Dwayne Rumbaugh, scientist emerit emeritus, at the Great Ape Trust of Iowa described the gardeners' success in teaching Wasso how to talk as absolutely frontier-breaking work. Inspired by the reception of their study, the gardeners soon had Wasso not only speaking via sign language, but also writing poetry. After seeing a swan, Wasso signed water and then bird, something which Harvard psychologist Roger Brown described as like getting an SOS from outer space. Watteau's poetry inspired other cognitive researchers from around the world to teach their monkeys how to speak. Then, in the late 1970s, the excitement died down after other cognitive researchers failed to replicate the results of the gardener's ex experiment. When Columbia professor Herbert Terrace showed that what the gardeners thought was speech was merely imitation in anticipation of reward, the enthusiasm that characterized the early phase of the talking monkey craze collapsed into embarrassed silence. Wasso's eloquence was in reality nothing more than a manifestation of the same stimulus response mechanism that men had used to train dogs and other domestic animals from time immemorial. After viewing videos of various chimp-human interactions, including those of Wasso with the gardeners, Terrace concluded that there was no spontaneity, no real use of grammar, of the sort that characterized human speech. Wasso's conversation with the gardeners consisted of roughly 130 signs, which the monkey learned in reaction to prompts from the, her, her trainers. Wasso, in other words, made the sign language gestures the gardeners wanted not because she had anything to say or because she understood what the gardeners said, but in anticipation of a reward. She was not engaging in anything like human conversation. The excitement surrounding Wasso had more to do with Darwinism's unfulfilled hopes than any real ability of human speech to jump downward over the species barrier which separated humans from animals. Cognitive research was committed to materialism, atheism, and Darwinism. Getting a monkey to talk was important to maintaining that worldview because Darwinism assumed that there are no discontinuities but just ongoing and gradual continuity with small incremental steps between apes and humans. The gardeners and other cognitive researchers wanted Wasso to talk because they, like Harari, were deeply committed to Darwin's proposition that the difference in mind between man and higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. That concludes chapter two of E. Michael Jones' Jewish Fables.